to switch this on. Wait up. Right. Last time I came, I spoke on the, the rapture, the hope of the church. And uh, wow, as we look at world events, who would have believed they're talking about you not be able to go abroad unless you have this passport and everything else. And that's not the mark of the beast, but you can see the preparation for these end times. You can see, look at the wars building up in the Middle East. Israel and Iran are at each other's throats now, in each other's ships, exactly according to Ezekiel 38, last time things. The Bible is absolutely accurate, detailed, and I love it. As a young man, I needed to know if God was real. My background was uh, orphanages and foster homes, so a lot of insecurity, I need to to know if God was real. And through prophecy, there's a third of the Bible that's prophecy, and the church misses out, misses out a vital message when it doesn't teach prophecy because it proves the accuracy of his, his word. But it's because he's Lord. He's Lord. Now, thank God this morning for the hymns you've chosen because I struggle, Lord. What do you want to speak on this morning? And um, It's easy for people to sometimes... Oh, but it's, Messages that might tittle people's ears. I'm not into tittling people's ears. I want the word of God to go into our hearts this morning. And the, the message this morning is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we ask for the leading and guidance of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the hymns that have been chosen, Lord, that... Just witness, Lord, what the message is about, Lord. You are mighty, O oh Lord. You've never changed your purposes, Lord. Your word is still the same. It's alive, it's living, it's changing lives worldwide. Lord, it changed the heart of this hardened sinner many years ago, Lord. From drinking and fighting to a child of God. You are wonderful, O oh Lord. And let your word go out in mighty power. Changing lives this morning, Lord. All over the world. We thank you, Father, for who you are. Holy Spirit, I have myself all to you in the Word of God. Lord, asking for your direction to miss out that which you don't want me to speak, to add that things which you do, Lord. Lord, because you're alive, you're living, you're glorious, and you're mighty. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, we possess in our hands the most mighty weapon the world's ever seen or heard. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In the army, they're looking for the mightiest weapon they can. On an army exercise, uh, I trained as a brain gunner, and I was a brain gunner to the platoon I was in in the Turtle Army. It's a big weapon. And uh, the idea of the brain gun, it's so accurate at 2,000 yards. And the idea is to keep the enemy's heads down while you're section can get near because the rifles are 600 yards accuracy uh, but the powerful weapons but you know very soon the brain gun became old-fashioned then they got the belts where the, the bullets going through and they're looking for the most powerful weapons they can well i can give them the most powerful weapon it is the gospel of our lord jesus christ it has changed nations it has changed kings that bow down to the lord jesus christ it has changed empires. It has changed individual lives. It has changed the most hardened of sinners. People you would not expect are bowed down to Christ at the power of God's word. I still remember, uh, I was a youth leader at Wigan. They actually said I'd never make a youth leader, by the way. But I was a man of prayer. I loved young people. I'd loved God and I spent much time in his presence. And God took that youth meeting from 8 to 82. You see, God takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. I remember the youth rally we had. This guy coming forward. He had long hair. He had a tie around his head, hanging like this. And he come, what? How want you, Jesus? He'd already become a Christian. He ran a, he was leading a house group, 
about 15 young people of an inlay. And this young man came forward and he's never turned back. That man's name was Dave Walsh. It's Dave Walsh. And Carol, who was faithful in children's work and, uh, and ministry that she did, it's a joy to see Carol. I've not seen her for a long time. So it's good to make acquaintance again. But you need to know the weapons of your warfare. And it is sad to me that we have uh, the modern church seeks to use everything it can to attract people. Uh, whether it's concerts or loud banging music or uh, motivational speakers, there's a place for that, but it cannot replace the gospel. You've sadly had the prosperity teachers telling people, you want to be rich, come to Christ. You come to Christ because you're a sinner in need of salvation. The gospel, we've got to get back to preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. There is no other way. There is no other way. An old man of 85 years of age, when he went out to sea at 15 years of age, he heard one of the old preachers preaching the gospel. And it's dropped in his heart, but he did nothing about it. And at 85, John Flavel was the preacher, one of the old Puritan preachers. At 85, he's walking through the fields at home, thinking how active he is now, fit he is at 85. And suddenly, God, the Holy Spirit, reminded him of that message, every detail, from 70 years ago, every detail. And the word of God convicted him. At 85, he bowed down in that field and surrendered his life to Christ. That is the power of the gospel. I pray for all, Linda will tell you, I pray for all the young children's work at Abram that we did. Uh, we found an old journal. I was taking 60 on a trip here, 77 on a trip there. We took 50 kids to uh, Nose's Safari Park, come back with 47 kids and three monkeys. <laughs> now, uh, it was wonderful how God moved in Abram. And uh, when I married Linda, after cast death, People say hello in Abbott. said, who's that? Used to come to Good News Club. Used to come to Good News Club. And we look at the list we had, and I think half the children in Abram came to that Good News Club. Now we saw the word of God deep in the hearts. And I pray by the grace of God that these lives in this time will be touched by the Holy Spirit. We had four, was it last year, the year before, phone up. One girl from Wales crying over difficulties in a family, uh, illness. And sure and test me, the word of God and humor. And she said, thank you so much, Harry. I'm praying for her. So it's never left that person from all those years. On the buses, when God moved on the buses, I, I, 38 and a half years on the buses, and when God got hold of my life, it was, at first, I just accepted it. It's through my wife had an accident and Kath had an illness. It started off with, and she started going to church. Well, a, a parent started trying to persuade me. Uh, the life I lived, a parents weren't sure about Kath marrying me. Uh, and of course, they didn't know my background. I'm a Scot by birth. I have no history. Uh, you know, the, uh, security of a family, whatever, as I had. Thankfully, I had a good foster family. But eventually I went. And they were surprised I never knocked it. They were going to church, telling about Jesus, and I never knocked it. Because at 13 years of age, I sat on the bank of a lodge at Standish, thinking life wasn't worth living. I used to get some batterings for stealing. But it's one of her own daughters doing the stealing, and I got the blame. And the eldest foster sister, who's always loved me, still does, Rosalind, was only saying a few years ago, I said, she said to her husband, I used to feel so sorry for Harry. He got these batterings, but he didn't do it. But you know, on the bank of that lodge that day, God spoke into my heart and said, no, Harry, there's something better. And at 22, after months after I first went to church, because I sat at the, near the back door, uh, the back seat, and used to get out afterwards to Abram Labour Club afterwards. Uh, but God began to deal with my heart. But it was on army exercise. It had been a tough exercise, and we called in this some like a working men's club on the Isle of Man. They give us a day off and the lads are drinking and that. But this woman's singing secular songs. And then suddenly she starts singing 
amazing grace, how sweet they sound. And boom. God started dealing with my heart. And over the months afterwards, I came back off that army exercise knowing my heart was black with sin, knowing I was lost, knowing that I had no hope of eternal life. See, God was using the gospel message I'd heard to convict me of sin and show me my need of Christ. But could he forgive me? For it, because I put my hand up in church. And they said, said this prayer. Oh, you're saved. Like Paul Washer said, it's, it's the prayer that sent many people to hell. Because it said this prayer and you said, no, it can be a start. But unless you're brought with conviction of sin and surrender to Christ, you're not saved. But one night I, I began, it surprised Kathy, I wanted to go to church. I wanted to know, could God forgive me? I had an insecure background, so I couldn't trust anybody's love. I couldn't trust God's love. Would he kick me out if I did wrong? Because that was my early life sometimes. But one night reading the scriptures, I got out of bed. And I said, Lord, I got on my knees in the bedroom where I was. And I said, Lord, I screwed my life up. If you can forgive me for what I've done, I vow I will give my life to you. And immediately... I have felt a sense of God's presence, his forgiveness, his cleansing, and I knew that my eternal address was changed. And God took this kid from an orphanage, and through it many bus drivers came to Christ, children, young people. God is a God that sees. He's a God that chooses all kinds of people, the rejects from all nations. I was in India. Went to India twice and seen what God is doing in India and what a joy it was to go in the villages in India and preach the gospel there and see their hunger for God that they had. But this gospel has changed the vilest and cruelest of mankind. I read, well, listened to a testimony of two bouncers, hardened men. One was harder than the other. And one night, uh, Another bouncer gang came up and they gave them a paste in and this guy, his jaw was chained up and everything. Uh, and he was in hospital. So the, the other bouncer, his friend went to visit him and he's full of vengeance. I'm going to do this. And this other bouncer, I forget his name, but he couldn't believe it. He said, you need Jesus. Somewhere along the line in his life, he'd heard about Jesus. He said to him, you need Jesus. When the guy got out of the hospital, he said, come on. I want you to come with me. I want to kill these men. And the guy thought, I want vengeance on them, but I don't want to kill them. I want for murder. We said, look, why don't we go to church? And this hardest of them said, well, yeah, okay. And they went and they listened. And this hard, harder of them said, that were good. It shocked the other one. Well, let's go to this one. Uh, this big, it's a big church in, Linda, uh, in London. And they went. And these hardened men bowed at the foot of Jesus Christ, surrendered their life to him. Those men are still going in prisons today preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God can take the hardest of men and change them into saints of God, vessels of honor, clean them up. Men who no longer swore and booze and the rest of the stuff that went with it. What a God. That is the part of the gospel that sadly a lot of the church is leaving behind. It's the word of God that saves. Somebody said it's not the sword. It's not the... So we'll say, a sword is in the scabbard, isn't it? Scabbard. It's not the scabbard that saves. It's the sword that does the damage. And we, if you like, are the scabbard. But the word of God is the sword. It's the sword of the spirit. And when let's draw the sword out and use it. It's the sword that does the damage in hardened hearts. It's the sword of the word of God that sets men free. It is righteousness that exalts a nation, the Bible says. But sin is reproached to any people. Nations will be turned to hell. They forget God. It's not a nice message 
to give people. In the history of our land, Christians have been tortured in the reign of Bloody Mary. Before Queen Elizabeth I, she had 300 burnt at the stake, many others tortured, many in prison. But they would not give up the gospel. They would die for Jesus rather than deny him. And that's going in many nations today, Nigeria. Many, many people are being murdered, martyred for the faith in Christ. One 14-year-old child. The, these raiders raided the village and they stabbed this 14-year-old girl. And as she lay dying, one of them says, where is your Jesus now? Where is he? She said, you've just set me free to go meet him. You've just set me free to go meet him. Hallelujah. Eternal life. The power of God. The covenant is, of, the covenant is of Scotland. There's monuments all over the land. They, they believed in the king's authority to rule the land, but not in the king's authority to rule the church. And they were meeting valleys. They said to people, pray, we're, we're going to meet. And they turn up in the valleys, and the presence of God was mighty as they worshipped God in the valleys. There, one woman was stopped by government troops. Where are you going? She said, Lord, what do I say to them? I don't want to tell a lie. Oh, I'm going to the reading of my father's will, she said. Oh, okay. She was telling the truth, wasn't she? But there's monuments all of us gone to these men. Men were tortured. We, we saw the grave of one uh, violent man who's lord in, in Scotland for his murder of the Covenanters there. Bloody Drummond is his name. Bloody Drummond, that was the name. Mostly persecuted the church. But the gospel still went on. Scotland became known as the land of the book. Sadly, it's not so today. In England, in the mid-1700s, our land was known for corruption, violence, wickedness of all types. The Prime Minister was sleeping Lord North. They'd lost the uh, states in the American War. And the land was at a low. And God raised up through the Moravians, the Wesley brothers. And the Moravians were from Count Zindendorf. A young four-year-old said, Lord, I want all of you that I might be, you might be all of mine. Something like that he prayed. God used that young man and he affected missions throughout the world. But the Wesleys, many others were raised up in this land to preach the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. And within a generation, the Englishman's word became his bond. They knew that an Englishman said something because they was under the fear and the power of God. It changed this nation. William Booth, men like that, uh, when the revival declined, the awakening declined, God raised up somebody else. Oh, would to God he would raise up preachers again. They would boldly preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit and this nation be turned back to God. Every nation on earth has tried to ban this Bible. This Bible is the most loved book in the world, but it's also the most hated. Jesus is, almost, is the most loved person in the world, but he's also the most hated. And yet, while they were enemies, Christ died for them. One Muslim said, how can he die for his enemies? How can he die? And he came to faith in Christ because he realized he died for him. In Iran, after years of, uh, of the rule of this uh, government they have, the people now despise them. A lot of people despise them. There's many tribes in Iran. And many now come to faith in the Lord. It's the women actually leading the, the awakening. They're going out. They know they may be killed. They say, we may be raped, we may be tortured and then killed. They say, but it doesn't matter. We love Jesus. Preach it. Now, I've heard the figures I've heard, there are two million people in Iran in the last decade have come to faith in Christ. In the lockdown, because they've had nothing to do, 30,000 Iranians are visiting Christian sites. They want an answer. They want life. They want freedom. They want eternal life that you don't have to work for. 
And praise God, we don't have to work for eternal life. He paid the price. He did the work on that cross. Speaking of today's church, a theologian, dear Carson, said this. Many Christians do not know how to contend for the faith. Many call themselves evangelical, but they have no right to do so because they've left the gospel behind. They will do anything to attract people, but they will not preach the gospel when become politically incorrect. The church is looking for better methods, but God is looking for better men and women. If I say men, biblically, it's all it's okay. He's looking for people that will surrender their lives to him. People who will spend time in his presence. People who seek God for the village where they are. In the garden at morning, when I go, I'll pray from uh, Daryl and, and Chantel at that end to Paul and his wife at that end, praying for them. Oh, Lord, do something. Lord, do something in your neighborhood. A young lass moved in, Denise. And her father got talking to us and he said, I searched in all of Abram for the safest place for my daughter. And he said, this is the safest place. I thought, wow, you don't know the effect your prayers have on your neighborhood. If the church is removed, literally all hell will break loose when the church is removed. If you think it's bad now, when we're called to be with the Lord, there is no protection on the nation's. You have power with God when you pray. You protect your neighbors. You have an effect in this nation with your prayers. But what is the gospel? It consists of four main points. Number one, God created us, so he owns us. Second, man has rebelled against him. Third, God provided a way back through his son, the Lord Jesus. Four, man's response to accept or reject his offer of forgiveness. In the book of Romans, uh, one to, uh, chapter 1 to 4, Paul lays out God's plan. I'm not going to read them all, but, you know, because God created us, oh, sorry, this one verse, we'll, we'll speak on this one. Um, here we are. Paul could say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul, a theologian himself, mighty in the scripture before he came to Christ. But he could say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is the power of God unto salvation. Nothing else but the gospel. So the first one is God. Because God created us, he has a right to demand worship and obedience. God made the rules, not man. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I remember as a school kid coming from uh, home each night and there's a blacksmith's shop. It used to be a blacksmith in Standish. And often the doors were open and this guy was building a car from scratch, fiberglass and everything else. And I'd stop and look and he, he talked to me and tell me what he was doing. And it took a long time, months. And one day, he sprayed the car blue. It looked beautiful. And then I never saw it. It was up. You know, that man made that car. So he had a right to do what he wanted with that car, to sell it, he had a right to set who drove it and how they used it. Now, if that is so with a natural product that man makes, how much more with God that made us? God has a right to rule our lives. Scripture says in Psalm 8, verse 1 to 3, we were made for his glory to honor his holy name. He loves us and we were made to enjoy him forever. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them by name. I think if God can call all the scientists, uh, sorry, the stars by name, there's not one scientist on earth can do that. 
I think he's worth knowing. The second is man. Man has rebelled against God. Adam and Eve were just given two commands, that's all. Don't eat from the tree of life. And tend the garden. That's all they had to do. And every time I pick weeds, weeds up out of my garden every year, I think, Adam, what did you mess it up for? That's all he had to do. But Satan deceived him by getting the, to question God's motive. Satan says, has God said? Has God said? And when they believed Satan, they gave Satan authority to rule. For Adam had been given authority over the earth. And when he rebelled against God, Satan took that authority. Remember the temptation of Christ? Satan said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus did not challenge him. In Revelation 6, the scroll is in the hands of God. Who is worthy to open the scroll? And the Lamb of God was the only one open. It is the title deeds of the earth. And from then on, the book of Revelation is God taking his people, Israel, back to himself, but also taking the world back. And in Revelation, the mystery of God will be fulfilled. And we shall, we will not see it, but that generation shall see the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, coming back to claim what is rightfully his. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man had become rebels against the rule of God, the Creator. For human beings to, yeah, for human beings, imagine this. For human beings to consider that the Creator and His creation, to see the awesomeness and the wonder, but then decide that a wooden or metal idol or something or someone is more glorious and more satisfying and more valuable than the God. That is the greatest insult that man can make to God to bow down before any idol. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of God's holy standard. And it says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life to those that will turn to him. Whilst we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. The only begotten Son of God sinless and pure, was slain on the cross for our sins. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He's the way because man's lost. He's the truth because man has believed a lie. He's the life because man is dead in his trespasses and sin and is born for hell. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God's soul of the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you and I would believe in him, we should not perish but have eternal life. We don't have to wait for eternal life. I was speaking to some Muslim friends. Uh, I was doing some work for them. And they, said, they talked about eternal life. And they said, oh, we have to wait till we die to see if our good works outweigh our bad works. And I said, but Jesus... I still all the works for me. I have eternal life now. It's not based on my works, although we must honour him and live holy lives, seek to do. It's what he has done on that cross. When Jesus suffered horribly, not just physically, but for the first time, God the Father looked away from him. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had placed all the sins of humanity on Jesus and turned away. At that moment, Jesus looked filthy and vile with all the sins of the world and God the Father turned away. He bore the punishment we deserve. But he was the pure Lamb of God, the only one that could take away the sins of mankind. And then at 3 p.m., 3 p.m. he cried out, It is finished! The price has been paid. It's finished. And he said, he gave up his life. Nobody took it from him. He gave it. And by his own power, he rose again from the dead. Today is actually resurrection day. Did you know that? It's the Passover. Sadly, because of our calendar, it's going to be next week. Wait, it's Easter. 
But I work among the Jewish com- community, and uh, today is Passover, but it's the day when Jesus arose from the grave over 1,900 years ago. Glory to God, and soon he's coming back. But he arose triumphant over the grave, over Satan's sin and death. And he sat, he ascended on high. He sat at the right hand of God as our great high priest. But what is man's response? What is our response? We saw that God created us. Man has rebelled. But Jesus was God's provided answer. But what is our response? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The thief on the cross rebuked the other thief and confessed he was guilty and worthy of punishment. He cried out, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That moment, Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. I wondered this thief on his journeys. If you look at what he said, he called him Lord. He talked about his kingdom. I wonder if that man had been caught up in the crowds one day and heard Jesus preach. But his friend had pulled him away. No, come with me. That's rubbish, mate. But on the cross, at first he didn't recognize who this man was. He cursed him with the other. And then he heard him, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he acknowledged his guilt before God. And that night I acknowledged my guilt before God. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God wonderfully saved me. We need to know the word of God. We need to know how powerful our weapons are. Graham Bernard, a bus driver, he became uh, him and his wife, Jean. These two were living apart. They were getting ready to divorce. And they mocked me with the gospel. They made fun of it. uh, Jean didn't want to talk to me. But then suddenly, her back was troubling her. And one of the bus drivers had become Christians, Eric, come to a meeting with us. Full gospel business meeting. And there God healed her. Three weeks later, Graham got saved. That couple... Uh, I spoke Graham's funeral. They became leads in the church. I spoke Graham's funeral. Jean is now older but still loving the Lord. I saw God change so many lives because God is in the light and the darkness. God has said the soul that sinneth will die. Mankind, there's a film called The Walking Dead. It talks about prisoners in America waiting for their execution. The walking dead, they call them. And in a sense, mankind is the walking dead. We are under judgment. We are under wrath. That will be, we will have to face one day. But Jesus come alongside. He paid that price. So we don't have to be walking dead. We can walk living and alive in Christ. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You know, one of the main booklets I used on the buzzes was the chick booklets. Quite often there's 13, up to 13 Bible verses in there. Sadly, I heard a pastor say, oh, I don't give them out. They're full of scriptures. Yeah? Oh, people want this. No. They want the word of God. They want the gospel. That is what challenges them. The very thing that offends them is the thing that will save them. Glory to God. Glory to God. After nine years of praying for the bus drivers, crying out to God night and day for the souls, driving the bus at the evening time, it was quiet, pouring my heart out to God, in between trips, seeking God, in my meal break, going to the riverbank to pray and seeking God at night, taking the dog up the country lane on a slag tip called the Shep, seeking God for the souls of men. And one day, God said, Harry, I was on a bus praying, looking at Luke 4, 18, and God said, it's harvest time. And God began to move. And about 40 bus drivers plus gave their life to Jesus Christ. Jock McClellan, who left the buses, he went back up Scotland. 
And a few years after he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through the Bernards, contact him. He said, do you know, Harry, every one of those booklets I kept and reread, every one, the gospel changes lives. Let us not forsake it. Let us get back to preaching the gospel. Amen. Father our God, we bless you for the work you've done. We bless you for the history of this nation, how many lives you've transformed. We thank you, Lord, in Thailand today, Lord, last year, 1,435 people came from the villages to be baptized in the river. 1,435. I thank you for my friend Tony, who used to smuggle Bibles all over uh, the, the uh, area, give Bibles out into villages. And now the word has borne fruit. And thousands have come to faith in you, Lord Jesus. In Myanmar, Bibles have been given out there. And they're crying out for Bibles now. They're crying out for the word of God. Lord, let us not seek better methods. Lord, you're seeking for better men who will depend on your word and spend time in your presence. Men filled with the Holy Ghost and power. Lord, let that be for us in this day. Lord, now witness to your precious word. Holy Spirit, we pray. Give ourselves into your hands. And for those listening, Lord, we pray you'll do a mighty work. you confirm your word and souls will be saved for your glory in Jesus' name.